Welcome to this video. My name is Roland Warzecher and if you follow my videos and my posts on Patreon or Facebook, then you are well aware that one of the focuses of my work is the reconstruction of combat with sword and shield. My partner in crime, Cornelius Berthold, and I are constantly working with the fencing manuscript 133, that is um, a fight book, a fencing manual dating to about 1320, possibly somewhat later, um, that is about fighting with a small shield, the buckler, and a sword. And this is the oldest fight book that we have. Uh, all other sources that are actual manuscripts on combat are a lot later and um, we don't have any material from the High Middle Ages or from the Early Middle Ages that would compare to this. So in order to reconstruct how people were fighting with sword and shield in periods predating the fight books, we have to look at period arms and armor such as Surviving shields, we constantly examine original swords and weaponry of all sorts. And of course, it's required to also look at period depictions in artwork. There are thousands of illuminations in contemporary manuscripts that are of interest in regards to posture, but also equipment. And um, then, of course, there is sculpture. And in this video, I want to present to you a monumental sculpture of about 1240 that is of particular interest um, for not only for um, enthusiasts of swordsmanship, but also for all of you who love armor and living history. So please follow me to, to Magdeburg Cathedral and let's have a look at the wonderful statue of St. Morris. During a recent research trip, Cornelius and I also visited Magdeburg Cathedral. Magdeburg was one of the most favorite places of 10th century ruler Otto I. And the cathedral houses the tomb of this first emperor of the German Roman Empire. Next to Otto's tomb, there's a copy of the Holy Lance, also known as the Lance of St. Morris. Today the original is kept in the Imperial Treasury in Vienna, and it allegedly contains a nail or fragments of a nail from the Cross of Christ. Otto was convinced that it was the lance that empowered him to win a decisive battle against the invading Madias in 955. This battle was fought on St. Morris's day and after his victory Otto swore that he would erect a church in honor of the saint. And here you see the statue of St. Morris, who allegedly had been one of the commanders of the Theban Roman Legion in the 4th century. This work of art was created somewhere between 1240 and 1250, and it shows the saint with African physiognomy as a contemporary knight in the armor of the day. The statue is not complete anymore. As you can see, it lacks its lower legs and 
the saint was probably holding a lance in his right hand and with his left was leaning on his shield. The lower part of uh, the sword is missing too and the statue has seen a number of repairs over time. Morris wears a coif, a separate coif, over his armor and around the head there's some kind of uh, recess. Um, looks like some kind of diadem or coronet is missing or maybe um, this is supposed to show that um, there's some kind of uh, leather band um, running around the head that is molding some kind of cap, um, padded cap that he's wearing underneath. Maybe the experts for coifs can enlighten me in this respect. Now the armor is of major interest here because this is one of the earliest representations of a coat of plates. This coat of plate is um, a rather simple, uh, simple example of this kind of armor. It looks like it only consists of some kind of girdle or belt consisting of vertical plates. You can see the rivet heads uh, showing on the front and um, the whole is um, the, the, the plates are riveted to some kind of overgarment that might have been uh, a textile one or leather we don't know um, the original um, the original color of the armor on the statue was uh, gold it was gilded uh, but it's worn like a poncho so um, you would have a uh, a, a kind of uh, poncho, a hole uh, at the top for the head to pass through and then the girdle would pass around the body and would be fastened on the back. Now unfortunately uh, with this position of the statue I can hardly get a good view of the back but um, fortunately I do have this wonderful catalogue at hand this one about the master of Naumburg um, that is a sculptor who probably made some of the most wonderful pieces of uh, the mid 13th century in the region and in this book um, there's a photo which shows us the back too. So looking at the back you can see that the coif the back uh, part of the separate coif is hanging down and the back part of the poncho is overlapped by the girdle which closes in the center and there are three buckles and three straps, three opposing straps passing through it each of which is fastened by means of rivets. There's one central rivet in the center of each strap then the strap is split to form three terminals, each of which is riveted to the, the armor too. It looks like there's some kind of central belt running around the complete armor and I can't really tell but it seems or I find it quite possible that some kind of uh, mounts had originally be, been uh, fastened to this belt. There is a surviving coat of plates from Visby. That particular example has horizontal um, plates at the front but uh, it sports some additional mounts that are fastened to the armor. So possibly there were some kind of ornamental mounts uh, on this center girdle that St. Morris is wearing. In the book on the finds from the Battle of Visby in 1361, there is a reconstruction of the armor of St. Morris. And it shows the 
it shows the armor spread out. So here is the center with the coif, and this is the girdle. On the opposite side, you would expect the various plates uh, that you can that are indicated by the rivets running around um, each edge of the white uh, waist belt. Here are the straps, here are the buckles, and um, there are possibly some shoulder pieces riveted in up here too. The rest of the garment doesn't seem to be um, it doesn't seem to be reinforced by means of plates. You can also find a reconstruction of St. Morris's armor in this title of Osprey Men at Arms, German Medieval Armies, 1000 to 1300, and um, on page 32, there's a reconstruction. Um, that is inspired by the armor of St. Morris in Magdeburg Cathedral. Now this knight here that is shown here uh, in this book, um, they say it's about 1290 and um, as I said the armor, or rather the statue is 1240 to 1250, so this kind of armor you could actually expect in the mid 13th century. Beneath his coat of plates, Morris is wearing a hauberk, a mail shirt with long sleeves and integral mittens that appear to be secured at the wrist, probably by means of leather thongs. This recess, which indeed may actually be a leather strap or a thong, um, does in fact look very much like the recess that I have already mentioned, the one, mentioned, the one that runs uh, around his head. So maybe this is just a leather, a leather strap after all, and um, not any coronet or diadem missing at the top of the statue. On the left side, partially hidden by his forearm, is a dagger. Now this dagger features a pommel and the sheath is the sheath terminates in um, a shape that sports a kind of spherical extension at the very end. It's very hard to see, but uh, the gown of Morris that shows beneath his hauberk, uh, which is uh, of a dark green, is decorated with stylized catrafoils, um, or maybe diamond shapes, and uh, some um, golden lilies that are interspersed between the squarish um, ornaments. The, the diamond shaped ones. And finally for the sword. The handle is partially covered by the right forearm but we can see a really interesting pommel above the forearm. It vaguely looks like um, a Brazil nut pommel but this one here is actually faceted and um, in profile, you can see that it slightly tapers towards the top, and that is actually quite typical for medieval swords. The flat side sports a vertical ridge that runs along the center line. The cross guard appears to be of square cross section. And the 
hand grip of the sword appears to be wound with um, some kind of spiraling thread. At least there's a red uh, spiral running around the uh, running around the handle that uh, can clearly be seen here. The small pointed extension of uh, the upper leather of the scabbard is quite typical for the period and here it looks like its edges are decorated. There are remnants of contrasting colors, contrasting paint that can still be made out uh, along the edges of uh, this little flap. And this scabbard or rather the belt arrangement differs from the one that is um, that can be seen um, with the donor figures at Naumburg Cathedral which sport um, a lacing that forms an X just below the scabbard mouth. Here this is a Z. This kind of belt the um, sword belt arrangement is also shown in the Codex Manesse and in um, plenty of other period sources. You can see one such example here, as well as an illustration of a surviving original scabbard from Torino in Italy. On this page of the Book of Sword and Shield that I have been working on for a couple of years now, if you wish to receive a personal notification on the book's completion, you are most welcome to send an email. And you may also care to note that patrons of mine who support my work via Patreon have access to exclusive previews from the book. Note the wide hip belt. It's really wide. I have plenty more material, like hundreds of photographs and videos on uh, St. Lawrence, but also on a lot of other statues. In fact, in my archives, video clips, original clips, are piling up, uh, waiting to be edited. Um, a lot of stuff on original weapons. Für diese, äh, für, die, für, das dünne, für das dünne Schwert, ähm, das eben diesen Angel. Original Shields. Dann haben wir das zweite Mal. Also ein Cut hier. Which is also, can also be seen on the back. Making Replicas. I have these big uh, nails that fasten the center strips. Yes, uh, the two, uh, and of course, combat reconstructions. And if you're interested in this kind of material, then you're more than welcome to um, help me to make for more time to edit this material, make it uh, available to you. And you can do that by becoming a patron of my work via patreon.com. So um, please take a look at my Patreon site. Uh, the link is below the video in the caption and um, there are by now some 400 posts or so, a lot of material like illustrations and um, articles, uh, videos and other material. Uh, so don't, um, don't miss to check it out. And of course, I very much would like to express my gratitude to all my generous patrons who support my work and enable me to go places. And um, I'm really grateful and hope you will bear with me. Have a great day.